And welcome to the 17th meeting in 2018 of the Culture, Tourism, Europe and External Relations Committee. I'd like to remind members and the public to turn off mobile phones and any members using electronic devices to access committee papers should please ensure that these are turned to silent. Our first item of business today is a decision on taking agenda item four in private. Are members agreed? Our first item on the agenda today is an evidence session with the Ambassador to the United Kingdom for the Republic of Bulgaria. Bulgaria holds the presidency of the Council of the European Union and I'd like to welcome the Ambassador, His Excellency Konstantin Dimitrov. Uh, welcome and uh, I understand that you would like to make an opening statement. Well, thank you very much, Madam Convener, uh, Honourable Member of the Committee, I am indeed privileged to address you today as we enter the final phase of the Bulgarian Presidency of the European Union. It is a historic opportunity of my country, formerly a communist bloc country, to assume the presidency of this important political, economic and civilizational project we call the European Union. I'll be very brief in my introductory statement so that we have more opportunity for questions and answers that would address more directly those areas of interest or concern that you have as representatives of the Scottish people. Uh, point number one in our priorities, uh, even though not necessarily the most pleasant one from the viewpoint of Bulgaria, this is the ongoing process of negotiations for the uh, departure of the United Kingdom from the European Union. We are entering an important phase, A, for the completion of the withdrawal agreement. Hopefully progress will be made, if not by June this month, by October, so that an agreement for withdrawal could be signed, which includes a full, a summary, a full uh, detailed description of the uh, expected transition period, plus a declaration of a political nature that should uh, lay down the framework for the future legally binding uh, arrangements for the relationship between the United Kingdom and the European Union after the United Kingdom leaves the European Union in the legal sense of that word. An important element of both the withdrawal agreement and the future agreement will be the rights of EU citizens on the territory of the United Kingdom and reciprocally the rights of uh, UK nationals on the territory of the EU members. In a word, uh, the progress in that particular area has been very satisfactory. We don't see any major impediments at this point of time to reaching, to reaching a mutually satisfactory uh, set of rights and obligations that would address the expectations of EU and UK citizens respectfully. The same holds true at this point in time about the uh, financial re arrangements related to the obligations of the United Kingdom as it departs from the European Union. There are other aspects that are yet to be clarified and if you have an interest in discussing them to the degree possible, I'll be ready to engage in a dialogue on these matters of the, uh, 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 in the context of the Brexit negotiations. Our agenda is not, however, confined to the issue of Brexit. Another important task of ours is the uh, right focusing of the initial debate on the multi-annual financial framework for the next financial six or seven year period in the functioning of the European Union. We are satisfied with the start and our capacity to moderate this difficult debate. We are hopeful that the budget will retain the centrality of cohesion policy, which is important for the catching up potential of countries, especially of Eastern Europe, but also of other parts of the European Union, so that the European Union is not only uh, civilizationally cohesive, but also economically and uh, socially cohesive as well. The same centrality we aspire to achieve in preserving in uh, the regional development programs of the European Union. And therefore, uh, we are looking forward also 
to an opportunity of the, for the United Kingdom to continue to selectively participate in, sp in specific regional development programs of its own choosing in coordination with the plans and the opportunities presented by the budget of the European Union, even after the period, after the moment your country leaves the European Union. No less important on our agenda is uh, are the future of the common agricultural policy, another area where consensus is sometimes very uh, hard to achieve because of the different views of differing views of member states on the future and the centrality of the common agricultural policy. Also, a workable budget is needed for the digital agenda. We have to work very hard and we, we lay down the grounds for it of the digital single market, the protection of personal data and the common efforts to fight against cybersecurity challenges. An important priority for the member for the presidency of Bulgaria is the reaffirmation of the European perspective for the Western Balkans. Uh, by Western Balkans, we understand the countries in Southeastern Europe that have not yet started or have just started their membership negotiations for uh, acceding into the European Union. Uh, we are very uh, rewarded by the fact that the United Kingdom continues to take a very active interest in the future and. Europeanization of the Western Balkans. Bulgaria hosted an important summit of the European Union devoted on the, Europe, on the Western Balkans on the 17th of May 2018. And we are looking forward to a meeting in London at the highest level hosted by Prime Minister Theresa May, which will continue to develop the momentum of focusing and underpinning the perspective of the Western Balkans with concrete projects in areas of transport, digitalization, uh, energy, connectivity, and indeed institutional integration. Last but not least, I would like to touch on a final uh, important element of uh, uh, our prioritization for the presidency. This is my, uh, the management of migration policy, a very difficult area that is an open secret, with once again differing interests by member states on, the, on whether or not Bulgaria, um, sorry, the European Union will be open to more of managed uh, migration into it through Europe, or there should be further reduction into the processes or into the flows of migra for the, uh, the flows of migra migrants, be they legal or illegal, into the European Union. Another important aspect of the problem is the issue of the voluntary or, in inverted commas, compulsory relocation of migrants in accordance with uh, possibly amended texts of the applicable Dublin Convention. However, here I am sad to say progress is very limited, if at all, but we are still hopeful to push the agenda for a progress on amending the existing uh, a key community of the European Union, so that the expectations of all uh, of our uh, people, the nationals of the respective member states, and indeed the international community as a whole, is better met, so that we combine the principles of solidarity, uh, our commitments to the international documents on uh, refugees, and at the same time certain concerns uh, related to the influx of uh, a large number of member states are concerned in a combination that reflects a balanced, uh, uh, a balanced uh, account of the individual interest of the member states. At this point in time, uh, Madam Convener, I'd like to stop so that I could give a chance to the honorable members of your committee to uh, give their comments and also ask questions if such exist. Thank you very much. Thank you very much, uh, Your Excellency. Uh, you talked about uh, Brexit and the progress that had made, been made on citizens' rights, uh, which is, of course, welcome. Can you say a little bit more about the, 
the EU27's other priority issues, uh, such as the island of Ireland, and in particular whether the Bulgarian presidency of the EU is hopeful that the Brexit talks might make significant progress at the June European Council. Indeed, the issue of the so-called uh, uh, Irish border, which means about how the European Union could uh, and, and the United Kingdom could uh, uh, square the circle of the following points, which I will mention later on, is critically important. How to retain the constitutional integrity of the United Kingdom, how to fully translate the provisions of the Good Friday Agreement into a reality, into a post-Brexit reality without violating the spirit or the substance of that agreement, and how at the same time we respect the international legal norm of the fact that the UK will be a non-member of the European Union, whereas the Republic of Ireland will continue to be a member of the European Union. So these three elements constitute uh, the problematic need of squaring the circle. In practical terms, at this point of time, we at 27 expect a more detailed proposal by the UK government, hopefully very soon, whatever that means, on a detailed description of the backstop arrangements on that particular point that could be applic applicable in case innovative solutions are uh, uh, contemplated by the United Kingdom government take time that is longer, might take time that is longer than the period of the transition post March 20, uh, 2019, that is post the date of December 31st, 2020. This is, I think, the most concrete description of our expectation which I am allowed to mention now and which I think is well understood by, uh, by the government of the United Kingdom. We hopefully would receive that clear and more detailed description of uh, their uh, idea of how to tackle the issue so that one of the impediments to the smoother continuation of the finalization of the withdrawal agreement be removed. Thank you very much. I think it's fair to say that we're with you in anticipating that particular document. I'll hand over to Claire Baker. Um, thank you, convener. Uh, you talked about the multi-annual financial framework being uh, worked on at the moment, and then the policies coming out of that, the UK selectively, the expectation the UK would selectively participate in ongoing programmes. Um, after after uh, the UK withdraws. After we yeah. withdraw, yeah. yes. Mm -hmm. Do you see the process that's ongoing at the moment? The, uh, UK, well, the UK's influence within the current discussions around the financial framework and the future of the CAP policy and the future of Horizon uh, 2020 funding, do you see the, the current situation is the UK's influence on these policies uh, my understanding, with the qualification, of course, that uh, I'm not working in Brussels, is that the United Kingdom is very cautious not to overstep uh, the mark between what it gets involved for the period up to the uh, withdrawal from the European Union and uh, on issues which concern primarily the work and functioning of the Union after your withdrawal. However, we have a clear political declaration on the part of, your, of the UK government that there is an interest of participation on a case-by-case -case basis in regional development programs that reflect A, the interest, and B, the traditional strategic commitments of the United Kingdom to regional development programs that enhance the capacity of uh, East European nations, including Bulgaria, to catch up in their socio-economic development. And uh, we welcome this uh, firm political declaration as another testimony to the strategic commitment by the UK government to the future of Europe, especially 
to the future of Europe from, the, from that part which belonged to the former communist bloc. Um, I was interested in your comments around migration policy and the recognition that it is difficult for the EU to to deal with it, to deal with this issue. Um, you will, yeah, yes. you'll, you'll be aware that the type of debate we had in the UK around Brexit and around the referendum, uh, migration was a significant issue within that debate. Do you find um, the pressure on the EU in terms of migration policy that there's any how, how do you, in the role as the presidency, try to keep the, the 27 countries united around this issue? Do you have any concerns that other countries are considering their uh, membership of the EU? Does this issue have traction in other countries in terms of presenting that kind of threat to the stability of the EU? Now, my observation, and I think it's not only my observation, is that the, the issue of migration, unlike maybe in certain quarters of the United Kingdom, is not a reason for people to uh, give up on their aspirations to join the European Union. Uh, the uh, desire by aspirant countries to join the European Union has been retained at a very high level, irrespective of the challenges faced faced by uh, uh, these countries in areas of migration or certain instabilities in the Eurozone and so on. Uh, and uh, I would like to contrast the problems that we have, especially at 27, on uh, rearranging the management of migration flows and the excellent climate of cooperation that we, especially as ambassadors in London, have with your home office and other institutions on the practicalities of uh, uh, regulating the status of EU nationals who have arrived in the UK before the day, who, who had arrived uh, to, in the UK and had uh, been permanently staying in the UK before the date of the referendum, who will have already been here by the date of your withdrawal who will have been here by the date of the expiry of the transition period. The only area of relative obscurity remains the status of EU citizens who will arrive in the United Kingdom for the first time after the end of the transition period. But it's very natural that we have uncovered all aspects of the future relationship. We are yet to adopt a political declaration we're yet to begin working on the concrete, legally binding texts. So overall, wh whereas to sum it up, the problem of migration flow management that concern primarily the 27 nations accepting the UK, uh, the ongoing dialogue with the British authorities on the status of EU citizens in the UK is generally considered to be satisfactory, which is a very good news for my compatriots, for example. Thank you. Jim McDean. Uh, thank you, Convener. Uh, good morning, Ambassador. Um, I'm really fascinated to hear your comments this morning. Um, and, and following on from your previous statement around the reciprocal arrangements for, uh, for nationals, both here, uh, those who may arrive during the transition, um, and I would also like to focus on the issue of around seasonal workers, perhaps, as well, which is an important uh, issue around uh, Scotland and indeed the UK's rural economy. Um, given your confidence that there are satisfactory arrangements in place uh, around the, the status quo, notwithstanding any changes that may happen in the future, which are the, the unknowns, why is it, in your opinion, that there has been a reduction in the flow of uh, seasonal migratory uh, workers, uh, specifically from Eastern Europe uh, many from your own country. Um, and just to give an example, uh, a lot of uh, Scottish farms who rely quite heavily on, on that ha have seen drastic reductions to the point that farmers have been flying over to, uh, to Bulgaria and other countries to try and recruit to cover people's costs to come here. And one uh, operator, one, one uh, cooperative of, of farmers in Scotland was recently quoted as saying that they believe that the Eastern European tabloid media had been painting a very bleak picture of the situation at the moment. And given that there are no legal restrictions on people coming, what do you think the social issues are around stopping people coming here even today? 
In my view, there are a number of factors for a relative decline, but I wouldn't call it an absolutely dramatic decline, relative decline in the uh, interest of East European seasonal workers to come to the United Kingdom. Uh, one of them is that those who have already arrived and uh, began working legally as seasonal workers have been able to adapt themselves on a more permanent basis in the United Kingdom and to, cho to change the type of profession that they would like to exercise while residing in the United Kingdom. Secondly, contrary to the idea, the, the perceptions of parts of your public may be fueled, these perceptions are fueled by some of your wide circulation newspapers, let me put it this way. Contrary to this belief that the United Kingdom is a great magnet for the law skewed labor force, there is an element in, uh, concerning the standard of living in the United Kingdom. It's relatively expensive for East Europeans to live in the United Kingdom compared to opportunities in other more uh, less expensive in inverted commas European Union countries, especially having in mind that some of those countries overcame the most acute phases of the economic crisis they have been living through after the, uh, the, the problems with the Eurozone and in the financial crisis of 2008, 2009. That's the second element. And the third element maybe is the element of insecurity about their long-term status in the United Kingdom, especially if they're yet to arrive. Even though we are technically speaking at the end of your uh, full membership, we haven't yet entered your transition period, still in the perception of the uh, average national there always lingers the question, am I sure if I commit myself to the United Kingdom if I'm not given the same status that my compatriots have who have already arrived? Is it worthwhile the, uh, the risk taking? On top of it, it's a seasonal work with, without guarantees for any uh, long-term uh, employment, if you will. Maybe these are the factors that uh, in a specific way combined in the minds of those who show greater reticence to commit themselves to repetitive seasonal work in the United Kingdom. At least that is my explanation. Thank you. We have a supplementary from Richard Lockhead. Uh, thank you very much. Can I just ask a supplementary to Jimmy Green's theme there? I expect that many of your nationals are seeking official advice from your government. What official advice are you giving nationals who ask about status in the UK or whether or not they should come to the UK and work, in, in seasonal work or whatever? Uh, the uh, procedures to be adopted by your government in dialogue, as I said, with us, the member states, and the representation of the European Union in London and probably in the, uh, in, in also in Edinburgh and in Belfast and in, in uh, Wales as well, uh, these uh, uh, procedures have not yet been finalized and therefore we at this point do not embark upon an active information campaign as to the way in which people could uh, revalidate uh, their legal status from a permanent status, as we call it now, into a settled status that may be called after you withdraw from the European Union, so as to avoid confusion, to create false impressions about the actual rights, starting from the uh, uh, content of the questionnaire that should have to be filled in, going on to issues related to family reunification, uh, pension benefits, social benefits, and so on and so forth, Maybe by the end of the summer we will have greater clarity on the total plan of the United Kingdom government and thereafter we are ready to engage into an explanatory campaign both through the uh, sources, digital and other sources of the Bulgarian embassy, but also inside Bulgaria and that seems to be the expected plan of action of other countries whose nationals are among the uh, uh, economic migrants into the Un uh, United Kingdom. At this point in time, it's a bit premature to uh, 
engage, as I said, in an information campaign because it may be a bit misleading before uh, the plans of the UK government in coordination with the European Union have been finalised. Thank you. Uh, Marie Gujan. Thank you, convener. I, it was really just in terms of some of the, the identified priorities that you had for the presidency and also in relation to some of the comments that you made in your opening statement about the multi-annual financial uh, framework because it was really just to get your views on where the main opportunities lie within the new framework because I believe that I, I think one of your priorities was on the future of Europe and young people and I believe that the budget for Erasmus is due to double and obviously that's a uh, the Erasmus Plus programme is something that this committee has done uh, a report on because we believe it's something that, well, it is something that Scotland very much still wants to continue to be a part of. So it was really just to hear about some of the opportunities that you think will exist within the new financial framework uh, and, for example, other, other areas that we might wish to, uh, that we can take part in. Um, because I know that there are some areas of concern within the new budget as well around, particularly around cuts to rural development funding too. So really just to get your views on that. Starting from your final point, Madam, uh, I did mention the common agricultural policy because there are problems there. And uh, the retention of the level and the categorization of the funding in the uh, uh, common agricultural policy is something that the fight is yet to enter its acute phase. We are start at the initial phase of the, of the debate on the multi-annual financial framework but we would like to retain uh, the levels of agricultural support while at the same time uh, agreeing to the need of reforming the principles of financing agricultural farmers, especially whenever we talk about support for smaller scale farmers versus the obvious advantage that throughout the years larger scale farmers have been enjoying uh, as a result of the current architecture of the common uh, agricultural policy. Erasmus is an important uh, priority. We support its um, centrality in the multi-annual financial framework. We are also happy that the United Kingdom and also the uh, devolved institutions of Scotland are very much interested in continuing an active participation in the programs of Erasmus post-Brexit. Uh, the academic and scientific excellence of the United Kingdom institutions is something we will continue to treasure. And as far as Bulgaria is concerned, we'll be most welcome to guarantee the access and also the potential, the access to by UK institutions or non-governmental uh, bodies uh, research centers, universities, laboratories, and so on, to the Erasmus program projects and vice versa, helping your uh, research and technological capacity to develop as a result of the cooperation with the European Union because we think that the retention of a cutting edge role of the United Kingdom in specific scientific areas is also important to retaining your stature as one of the leading uh, forces inside the G7, the P5, the permanent members of the European Union with a determined interest in retaining the strength, cohesion and geopolitical weight of Europe. By Europe, I mean not necessarily only the European Union, but Europe as a civilizational identity in uh, difficult and competitive times. Thank you. Thank you. Stuart McMillan. <clears throat> Thank you. Uh, good morning, uh, Ambassador. Um, under the Bulgarian uh, presidency, um, has there been any activity uh, undertaken uh, to try to deal with uh, the rise of the populist movements across the European Union countries uh, with, a, uh, with a target of actually trying to safeguard the existence of the European Union uh, in future years? Well, thank you very much. This is an extremely important question. Whereas it seems to be a question related to uh, domestic politics or international party politics, actually, the European Union can do a lot. 
in one, through one particular angle in my view. And this is the angle of uh, managing without uh, unlawfully controlling uh, the digital space against attempts of waging a hybrid warfare, propagation of fake news, manipulation pub, uh, pu uh, public opinion by uh, distributing uh, non-facts, mixtures of facts and lies, because all of these elements of the information uh, warfare have to do with the capacity of populist movements to build up support for their uh, doctrines based on uh, a lack of proper solid knowledge about truth of reality in the heads of many of, poten of, the, of their potential voters. And that is why the European Union, through its uh, organized institutions and program to strengthen cybersecurity, to combat fake news, and uh, to enter in, an, in a far more simplified in language terms, but a more detailed debate about why the European Union, with its current set of values, is more conducive to the prosperity and security to the individual. This is where the European Union has a role to play, and that is how EU, on top of the national efforts, could combat the extremely dangerous extremities of certain populist movements all over Europe. Certain, excuse me, certainly in the, in the future, when the, the UK does leave the European Union, uh, it's important that uh, there is that, uh, that strength of an organisation and uh, that uh, grouping of nations who genuinely want to work together to be beside uh, the, this country um, in order to have that, uh, well, to try to have a better level of security, but also to try to have um, a, an understandable uh, level of trading arrangements uh, and also the, the issue of the, the likes of the Erasmus scheme uh, that Mary Goujon uh, spoke about. So it's, it's important that the European Union actually does uh, survive uh, for, uh, for many, many years to come. Mm -hmm. I, I totally share your view. Uh, we, we expect that the agreement, if it's one agreement, if I'm talking about the future agreement, it should contain uh, a, a, a trade pillar, a security pillar, be it uh, subdivided into, in, into justice and home affairs pillar and common foreign and security and defense pillar. Uh, and if it's a comprehensive agreement, if it's a sui generis agreement, not with any routine third country, but a special case of privilege and deep partnership, that would, I think, uh, be uh, a kind of outcome of this Brexit situation that would reflect the interest of the majority of the nationals of the United Kingdom, but also, I would say, the majority of uh, the nationals, not only in Bulgaria, but in most, most countries of the European Union. Uh, it is, however, the next step, and I stress it once again. Your government, and especially some of the supporters of the majority in the uh, United Kingdom Parliament, should understand that before we have uh, finished step number one, it's difficult to move straight officially to step number two. So we should concentrate on the finalization of the withdrawal agreement and on the finalization of the characteristics of the transitional period, including its de jure or de facto length. No, thank you. Thank you. Alexander Stewart. Thank you. Can you know? Following on from that, so, so your view, Your Excellency, about what the, the selective participation might well be going forward, uh, the, 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 the challenges, the barriers, and also the opportunities that the United Kingdom would have to ensure that there will still be participation, uh, although we're not <coughs> you're no longer with the, uh, but we would still have the opportunity to tap into that uh, and the expertise that we have and the expertise that you have uh, would be 
still being able to be assessed and processed across the, uh, the, the countries that are participating. So your view on how that would succeed? Well, it will be part of the future arrangement, the way in which uh, the United Kingdom could participate organizationally, financially, on programs instituted by the European Union for the period after your withdrawal. And the obvious areas are uh, regional development programs, projects regarding the cohesion strengthening of regions and countries from the less advanced uh, range of countries within the European Union, the issue of participation in operation uh, under the uh, motto of common security and defense policy of the, uh, of the European Union. Of course, having in mind that the UK will not be part of the decision-making uh, format, but it will be somehow incorporated into the decision-shaping consultative phase of, in, uh, of the concept to, uh, conceptualization and design of future operations. Uh, the UK should be also involved in, 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 uh, in projects related to uh, the realization of the common foreign and security policy of the European Union outside the geographical scope of the European Union. And, of course, in areas related to uh, science, research, and the uh, ability of the European Union to give young people a chance to get sooner rather than later a good qualified job based on overall improvement of the level of accessible education. Thank you. Thank you. Ross Greer. Convener, um, you mentioned, I'm asking your opening remarks around the, the challenges of the refugee crisis for Europe. Um, I'd be interested in um, <clears throat> how Bulgaria as a country who has been involved in that on, on two main fronts, my um, understanding is Bulgaria agreed to take in around 1,300 people through the emergency resettlement scheme, through, uh, 1,300 who'd arrived in Europe through Italy and Greece. Um, it'd be interesting to hear what progress has been made towards that, but also where it has more directly affected yourselves the, uh, with Turkey, the uh, agreement between the European Union and Turkey. How can, or how does Bulgaria as, as a border nation there ensure that the human rights of refugees arriving through Turkey are being respected given the concerns that the Union and, and through the Presidency has raised about the human rights situation in Turkey? Well, <clears throat> one has to be very precise in describing the way in which we deal successfully with this problem. Uh, we are bound by applicable international and national law to register every, every uh, foreign national who crosses legally the borders of Bulgaria, to, uh, to register him or her, and in, in the process of registration, they have uh, the, these uh, individuals will have to say where they're coming from and what, or, what are their grounds uh, for requesting uh, uh, refuge or uh, some other form of legal, probably permanent stay in a country of the European Union. We are bound by the current uh, convention as a country of first entry to register all those people, all those people on the moment they entry, we're not allowed to wave them by for them to go to another country. Uh, this is something which we have never done and will never do, even though this adds to the burden of uh, responsibility to Bulgaria. Uh, there is, however, another element that we cannot force people to remain in Bulgaria contrary to their will. In other words, we register them and then we are not allowed by any international treaty, including European Union, a key, to forcibly make them stay in Bulgaria. The only thing that they can do, I mean, the only permissible sanction is for them to, uh, uh, having been registered in Bulgaria, for them to be returned to Bulgaria by another country which uh, uh, establishes that the individual in question has come to that other country from Bulgaria. But once again, uh, the logic continues. Once you, you return the person to Bulgaria, 
you don't put him or her into a kind of a uh, camp. They continue to be relatively free in their movement. If they go away, and if they go away from Bulgaria, there has to be another return to Bulgaria. And this is something which is, which is not efficient. In other words, we say the following thing. We have to reduce the incentives of migrants to come to Bulgaria, we have to, uh, to, to the European Union. We have to crack down with greater determination on the international trafficking circles, uh, sorry, uh, gangs. We have to keep the all-important agreement with Turkey on the control of the refugee or migrant flows, uh, especially along the route from Syria through Turkey to Europe. And we have to, of course, appeal on the greater solidarity of other countries who have a very low level of, uh, migra uh, of migrants' presence in their, on their territories, but still very reluctant to even conceive of a voluntary acceptance of a kind of quote of migrants on their territory. And that is where uh, the most problematic uh, essence of the political debates uh, debates continue as we speak. And you mentioned there at the end that countries who have a very low profile of refugees arriving, that would include the United Kingdom, just given our geographical reality, but also given the policy intentions of the United Kingdom government. What would your hopes be for the UK's participation in European responses to the refugee crisis after we've left the European Union? Mm. It is, it is very clear that uh, uh, the uh, uh, expertise of border management is something we, we in Bulgaria value very much, and I think this is also the case with Greece. Uh, this is also the case with uh, Frontex as an organization of the European Union. Your expertise in border management, your expertise also in uh, uh, helping former military personnel who in times of crisis may be invited to control borders, how these former military officials could be retrained for rules of engagements with non-combatants because the refugees, even the, the most aggressive ones who want to cross the border illegally cannot be uh, equalized to, say, uh, jihadist terrorists in Afghanistan. They are civilians of a quite another, uh, quite different category. You cannot employ rules of engagements that are applicable to, to a combat situation. So therefore, the United Kingdom is one of those countries who have a very good training expertise for former or current military uh, women and men how they could be retrained to perform functions that are more characteristic to border guards in situation of extreme pressure on the borders of a respective country by migrants or refugees. So these are the two areas where you could be very useful in terms of cooperation. You, I mean, the United Kingdom. Thank you. Thank you very much. Now, we have very little time left, but I've got one more member to come in. If I could ask uh, questions and answers to be as brief as possible. Thank you very much, Tavish Scott. Um, Mr. Ambassador, can I just ask you about US trade policy and aluminium and steel? Will your presidency maintain the same very strong line the European Union has so far taken towards President Trump's uh, tariffs that are clearly seen as protectionist in terms of trade policy? Yeah, just in, a two, in two sentences, uh, this is something we have left to be handled by the European Commission. What we want, want uh, what we advise the European Commission to do is to exhaust all possible uh, channels of dialogue, but once, but once uh, uh, the dialogue has, has proven to be futile, we have to be ready to, to employ proportionate and that's very much countermeasures, that in themselves do not provoke a further escalation of the reciprocal trade sanctions because an all-out trade war is something that is uh, totally, would be totally detrimental for all sides in this, uh, in this uh, unacceptable situation. Thank you, Thank you very much. 
Uh, Ambassador, it has been a great pleasure uh, to hear from you today, uh, not only as the Ambassador, but also as a former member of the Bulgarian Parliament's European Affairs Committee. Uh, so thank you very much uh, for coming uh, to give evidence today. It's very clear the Bulgarian Presidency has made progress as well as faced significant challenges during your six months. But thank you again uh, for uh, coming to speak to us today. We'll now suspend. Business today, we will take evidence from STV to discuss their strategic plan, which was announced in May this year. Uh, representing STV, I would like to welcome Simon Pitts, the Chief Executive, and Bobby Hayne, Director of Channels. And I'd like to invite Mr. Pitts to make a very short opening statement. Thank you. Thank you, Convener, for inviting us here today. Uh, Bobby and I very much look forward to answering the committee's questions. Uh, and to begin with, as you say, I'd like to make a very brief opening statement to address the concerns raised in Parliament directly. We have never had better television than we have today. But television is also changing fundamentally. We're all watching differently, especially younger audiences, and the traditional players are under huge pressure from new global competitors like Google and Netflix. As a result, every broadcaster in the world is diversifying into new areas in order to survive and to thrive, and STV must do the same. When I arrived in Glasgow in January, I met every member of the STV team. 
Based on what I heard, I've now set out an ambitious growth strategy which is designed to re-establish STV as a creative force. This is what the board appointed me to do. They are backing a significant investment of £15 million over the next three years, far more than we are saving in any cuts, to set up STV for the future. This is not a strategy to prepare STV for sale to ITV or to anyone else. If that was the case, we simply wouldn't be investing. And I didn't leave a great job to become CEO of a company that just sold itself. I came here to build a successful future for STV, a healthy, profitable business serving Scottish viewers headquartered in Scotland and showcasing Scottish creativity to the world. However, to do that, we've had to take some difficult commercial decisions and I am very mindful of their impact on people's lives and people's livelihoods. Closing STV2 is one of those. Local TV has struggled right across the UK. Our channel launched as STV Glasgow over four years ago and has made a significant financial loss every year since. The disappointing truth is that despite the best efforts of our talented STV2 team, very few people are watching the channel. Our news team deliver the best news service in Scotland and we're very proud of it. But TV news audiences are in decline and if we want to avoid going the way of the newspapers, we have to properly embrace digital, just as our competitors have already done. That's why we're proposing changes. Our intention here is not to ask the team to do more with less, we're asking them to do things differently. I do understand the concerns expressed here though, Change like this is never easy and it needs to be done in the right way to protect our people and to protect the quality of our journalism. But virtually everyone told me the same thing when I arrived here, that STV doesn't invest enough in original programming for Scottish audiences, that we need to be famous for more than news, tag it and take the high road. So that's exactly what we're going to do. As you know from your recent inquiry into the Scottish uh, screen sector, what the Scottish TV market needs more than anything are high quality returning series made in Scotland by bona fide Scottish production companies. We have a wonderful opportunity here and I intend STV to be right at the forefront, making new programming for ourselves and other broadcasters and generating new jobs that, create, that keep creative talent in Scotland rather than losing them to London or America. The biggest threat to STV's independence and prosperity is to not be taking decisive steps like these to grow our business. I am absolutely convinced that the plan that we've set out, investing in creativity and in digital while making some tough choices, is the best way of securing STV's future as an independent business and a genuine Scottish success story. Thank you. Uh, thank you very much, Mr Pitts. We all understand that companies uh, need to diversify and change uh, in order to grow um, and we accept and know very well from our inquiry that TV and screen is indeed changing. I think what the concerns are um, in, raised in Parliament and indeed across Scotland is uh, the cuts to content and the cuts to creative jobs. Um, you're in a creative industry and how can you expand your creative content if you're, if you're cutting jobs? Well, our intention isn't overall to cut jobs, our intention is to create jobs in the medium to long term. Uh, you're dead right. Uh, what uh, this creative economy needs is investment. What it needs are returning uh, programmes made in Scotland by Scottish creative teams. At the moment there are very few of those programmes. Uh, we don't punch our weight as a nation uh, across the TV sector. I'm sure that's the evidence you've heard in your recent inquiry. You can name the number of shows that return um, uh, that are made in Scotland on, on, on one hand. Uh, Homes Under the Hammer, Antiques Road Trip, our own show, Location, 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 Eggheads. But you can't name any more than that. And there are hundreds of returning shows right across uh, the UK networks. It isn't good enough that we only have a handful. The way to create a sustainable, independent uh, uh, production sector and a real success story in Scotland is to invest. And that's exactly what we're doing. We are making, in total, two million pounds a year of savings. We're doing that in news, and I'm sure we'll come back to explaining the rationale for it. We're doing that in STV2, 
but we are reinvesting all of that and more. We're reinvesting £5 million, pounds, three more than we're saving every year for the three years of our plan, precisely into new programming for Scottish audiences that we can then sell around the UK and around the world. But that, that costs money. At the moment, STV Beyond News doesn't make much of its own programming. And many people have told me, inside STV and outside, that it's a shame that we don't do that and ask me why we don't do that. The truth is we have an enormous opportunity here. We have the biggest shop window in Scotland through our main channel, which gets a 23% share of all viewing in Scotland, which is 80% of all Scots, to make shows famous, to pilot them to a whole country, um, to then create a track record for those shows and sell them around the world. And I'll give you, if, you, if you'll permit, I'll give you a quick example of how positive uh, uh, the impact of a new returning show could be on the Scottish economy. We are currently, having, have just finished filming uh, for a new BBC One peak time drama called The Victim. Uh, it will come out later this, this year, it's a series set in Scotland, legal drama. Um, uh, it brings in, uh, it brings 100 new jobs. Uh, 100 people have been working on it, 87 of them are Scottish or permanently based here. Uh, almost all of the cast are Scots, um, Kelly MacDonald, John Hanna, uh, almost all of the backroom staff, whether it's the director or the exec producer. Those are the sorts of shows, if they return regularly to the Scottish economy, that are the bedrock of a business and the bedrock of a sector. We have another one in Antiques Road Trip, 60 jobs, almost year-round jobs because we we made 60 episodes of these for BBC Two uh, uh, just last year. Um, three million pounds into the local into the local economy. Those are the sorts of shows that we need to do more of. It's a real shame that we have so few of them in Scotland's name. Uh, my primary objective um, is to make sure that STV is at the forefront of a resurgence in Scottish uh, uh, production capability uh, and quality. Um, and that will be the test of whether STV has been a success over the next few years, whether we can do much more to drive the local creative economy. Where is this £15 million over three years going to come from? You've identified it's going to come from the £2 million that you're saving each year. That obviously leaves a shortfall. So are we going to see more cuts in your core business? No, we're not going to see more cuts. Uh, what we've done is redirect other spend from, from other areas. Okay, and which also other areas? Well, we currently spend a certain amount of money each year on what is called the block plan, um, which is to fulfil some of our licence commitments where we, we commission a, a number of shows. We are going to treat those shows rather differently. Um, we're going to treat them as potential uh, uh, pilots for new shows that can, be, um, uh, that can be sold around the UK and around the world. But just to explain what, what we do with our, our profits, because what we do is, 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 is reinvest, uh, and that's what we're doing here too. But there's been a lot of discussion that STV is a profitable business and why make cuts. We made £18 million of profit last year. Immediately, £9 million goes into paying the pension deficit, which is the right thing to do, obviously, but that's straight away £9 million. Uh, we then have investment, including things like new programming, but in technology and, and buildings and other things. And then we have dividends, which are paid out to our shareholders. Uh, and our shareholders hadn't seen a dividend for seven years. That was reintroduced in 2013. So what we have to do as a business is make sure we can uh, uh, continue to invest while continuing to move forward commercially. Uh, otherwise, shareholders get impatient. But we, are, uh, we have a set of shareholders who have uh, been very keen to support this investment plan, and that's what it is. It's a net investment plan. I've read a lot that has characterised what we're doing here as only cuts. And actually, this is a reinvestment of a net £3 million a year into the sector that we love, that we want to do better in, and we think Scotland deserves to do better Any in. Any details of where this investment is, is going? Well, I'll give you... Uh, I in have terms of jobs, in terms of expansion, there's, let, there's let me no start, detail at all. I understand the question. Let me, let me start to expand some of that detail. We have set out um, in the statement that we, we shared with everyone, uh, at shareholders and, and, uh, and everyone uh, two weeks ago, that all that money was going into three areas. It was going into new programming, 
uh, uh, for STV and for STV Player, our digital service, which needs to get better and to... Uh, so are you recruiting new people to provide that? Yes, we have already started uh, and you need people to make shows. So, how many new people? Well, this is a, this is a process because, well, well, I'll tell you how many. We have started uh, by... Um, creating what's called a formats unit within STV Productions. Uh, and this team will be purely dedicated to developing new shows, uh, the first wave of new shows for our main channel. Uh, we have published a structure which has seven new roles. Uh, that will be the engine room of uh, our piloting strategy, but it's not the full story because once a show, as you know, once a show gets commissioned, that's when it, it becomes a real thing. Um, and you need to then get in many more people to actually make the show. So we'll have a permanent headcount initially of seven, and then as soon as a commission is won, you scale up, just as we do uh, on the drama I mentioned, to 100 people, to Antiques Road Trip, to 60 people. So the potential here is for many more new jobs, if we're good enough, if we get it right. Um, a, a, a number of jobs that would, um, would dwarf the number of jobs that we are putting at risk with our... Uh, with our current plans. That isn't to say um, that this isn't uh, very, very difficult for those people who are affected by news. I totally understand that. These are uh, very difficult decisions and uh, there is considerable uncertainty as a result. But if we get it right, the rewards are very big, not just for us, but for the Scottish creative sector as a whole. Obviously, part of your public sector remit is to provide news um, and one of the issues that the NUJ has raised with us is that you haven't actually provided any uh, costings in terms of the plan to change news, for example, you know, that will, as you've said yourself, require additional technology, it will require training. Um, what are the figures for, for that investment? Well, there will be, and I'll pass to Bobby for some of the detail, but we will, um, we will still be spending £9 million on news at the end of this. Uh, it will still be the most significant investment we make in content, uh, more than double any of the other genres put together. And we have said that there will be investment in technology, in connectivity, um, and in training. Um, and we're serious about that. It's necessary for, for, for the new plan to succeed. you haven't given a figure. Well, we do have a plan, yes, uh, and we know how much the individual elements of it cost, and we know that it, it adds together to around £9 million pounds of investment, which is £1 million pound less than we've been spending in the last couple of years, but it's still significantly more overall than we spent on news in 2015, 2014, 2013, 2012. It is a, an enormous contribution to news, and it is enough to deliver high-quality news, the most comprehensive news, right across Scotland. Do you want to... Expand a bit. Yes, I think the plan that we've laid out with the £5 million per year of investment across the three years, which is the £15 million to create better content, to create new pilots, includes a million pounds of savings from news and includes a, another further million pounds saving from the closure of STV2. So it is fully costed and the news budget, which we've been very open about, will remain around £9 million. So it's roughly twice what we're spending on everything else. So it's by far the single biggest investment in any content that we make. Yeah. When you're cutting your news offering in the national capital of Scotland, how can that be considered to be uh, an, an advance in quality? Well, I think that the news that we have all around Scotland is differentiated by its localness. We broadcast news from four different news centres every night. We have contributions from other places. The contribution that we have from Edinburgh is one that we're very proud of. It reflects the capital and the east of Scotland. It sits alongside the programme that we have for Glasgow. In fact, what we're going to do is reconstitute the Central Belt offering so that people will still see a very rich offering of material from both east and west. They will see the presenters that they know anchoring stories and, of course, we will continue to have dedicated coverage and a specialist unit based here in the Parliament. So we will continue to have a very localised and very different offering on television that will move forward. But it will be a slightly different presentation of that. But we're retaining the studio base. We want to change the templates of the programme because we want to reflect changing times. Can I, can I just say you know, why it is we're making these changes in news? Because that's, uh, the, that's the root actually, of this. I, I'd rather move on to other members, actually, and I'm sure you have the opportunity to, okay. to see Understood. that and reply to other members. Claire Baker. Um, thank you, convener. Good morning. Uh, I don't think anyone in the committee would argue with the ambition from STV in increasing production. However, it doesn't look like a company that's in any financial difficulties. Uh, the 
remuneration package that's been offered to Mr Pitts in terms of the annual salary plus the golden hello that accompanies that, uh, the £80 million pre-tax profit that you've spoken about already, the inflated dividends to shareholders, which I understand returned in 2013 but are on an increasing uh, level in the last few years. Um, this doesn't look like a company that needs to make this level of cuts, and I think it's difficult for STV to justify the cuts in particular being made to the news um, service. And it, to me, it looks like people are losing their jobs in order to pay for the outlined increases to shareholders and, and annual salaries. Um, are you able to justify the situation that staff are facing at this time? Yeah, that's, that's not the case. Um, as I say, we, we made last year £18 million of profit. There isn't just a, a chest that we put all that money into and, and keep for, for, for later or, or hand back to our shareholders. Immediately, £9 million of that profit goes into paying down but there, our But there has been deficit. increases to shareholders. There has been increase in dividends. Uh, at the has, same time actually, that actually what we've announced is that, redundancy. Actually, what we've announced overall is that the amount that we will return to shareholders under this new plan will reduce. We've announced a small increase to the dividend, but at the same time, as you'd have seen from the, uh, from the release, that we have reduced the overall amount of the share buyback scheme that we had committed to last year um, uh, under previous management. Uh, it was going to be 10 million. We've said we're not going to, to give 10 million back to shareholders over a period. We're going to give seven, and we're going to put three of that uh, back into this new growth plan. So actually, net-net, we are giving less money back to shareholders under this new plan. But yes, it's, it's actually right that we distribute our profits in an, in an even way. First of all, first and foremost, to the pension plan, where many members uh, are still in employment or, or, or have retired. That needs to be robust, it needs to be paid for. Um, then into investment, and I've already outlined that's where the money, additional money is coming from to invest in new programming, into new technology, and yet yeah, also to, to our shareholders who have been very patient, who sat without a dividend for seven years and who had that reintroduced, and it's fine and right that it should be introduced um, uh, progressively uh, over the next few years. But they're one of many recipients um, of, of the profits that STV makes. The most important point here is that net-net we are investing more into the economy uh, as a result of these changes, not less as has been characterised here. Uh, and when it comes to my pay, um, you know from the letter that was sent to you by our chair, uh, Baroness Ford, that I don't set my own pay. What happens is that the board and the remuneration committee uh, set the pay and recruit um, in a competitive market in the way that they see fit. Um, my uh, total remuneration is in line uh, with the remuneration received by the previous chief executive for the last 10 years. It is totally in line with the remuneration policy. It is uh, supported uh, and approved by our shareholders. Uh, my focus here is, and what I'm paid to do, is to make difficult decisions in order to grow a business. And that is exactly what I'm trying to do. It is a strategy that overall will deliver an independent, successful, sustainable STV that builds for the future and that if we get it right, will create more jobs and more prosperity and make sure that we are independent long into the future uh, and take real advantage of what is a wonderful opportunity to put the Scottish production sector right back on the map. It's a pity there's no one here from the board um, this morning. And while I mean, perhaps you can recognise the argument that while there's an argument made that you will receive what is in line with national pay structures, the cuts that have been made to the news service will look like it's reducing the Scottish news service to a regional news service rather than a national, and that the status of the pay doesn't reflect the direction the news coverage is heading within. The thing I wanted to ask, at the beginning you said um, that change needs to be done in the right way. Um, is it the case that staff found out about the proposed cuts when the press release went out at the same time the MSPs found out about it? There was also staff who were told about redundancies as they were due to go on air. Um, can you understand the anger and distress this has caused among the new staff with STV? Yes, but let me, let me um, give you my side of the story, which is slightly different to that. Um, uh, first of all... Uh, the team didn't hear about it first in a press release. Uh, I spoke to them first, directly, on the morning, on Sorry. that same morning, that same morning, uh, in meetings from 8 a.m. 
Uh, the press release didn't go out until later than that. We're under, you know that we're under an obligation as a listed company to be uh, publishing information at the same time. We took a view actually that we could talk to our, uh, our teams first. Uh, that is exactly what we did. I spoke to the SDV2 team first because their news was somewhat more definitive and then I spoke to the news team straight afterwards. So the STV, can I just make a point about the STV2? Was it also the case that staff were involved in ongoing discussions around the future of STV2? At the same time, there must have been negotiations with That's Media about selling on STV2. And that was confirmed on the morning the press release went well, Actually, that's, that's not true either. Um, we exhausted our conversations about the future of, uh, of STV2 with our teams. We had working groups thinking about the future, not just of that channel, but of our overall uh, viewing proposition, whether it was STV2 or something else. We involved uh, many different people from across the organisation to give their views. Uh, and once we'd come to an internal conclusion and we had taken that conclusion and recommendation to our board, uh, yes, we then commenced discussions uh, in order to um, uh, uh, sell on the companies that hold the licences for STV2. But no, you're not right that th those two things were happening in parallel. That wouldn't have been right. Okay, thank okay, you. Thank you. Um, Ross Greer. Um, I should uh, say from the start, I'm both a member of the National Union of Journalists, but also I, earlier this week, had a private meeting with uh, Mr Pitts. Um, just to address the letter from Margaret Ford first, very briefly, because she's not here to, to answer to it, and it would be unfair to ask yourselves to do so. Um, the letter states that, uh, Mr Pitts, that your pay package and that your welcome package is uh, simply a reflection of, of market rates, of going rates. But as the chair of a board uh, of a company, uh, Ms Ford will understand that market rates are set by those in the market and that she is contributing towards that kind of upward wage pressure. The people who set market rates are the people who make the decisions that she made, including for, for your salary. But to look at wage ratios within the organisation, um, Mr Pitts, you're on my understanding as an annual salary of uh, £400,000. There are journalists in your newsroom on a salary of £18,000, which is roughly a ratio of 22 to 1. Do you think that is a conducive disparity towards creating top quality news content? As I say, uh, my pay is a matter for the board. That's why the chair of the board wrote to you. Um, I don't think it's right to suggest that that contributes to wage inflation, not least because uh, my annual wage uh, is in line with my predecessor's wage uh, and he was in post for 10 years. Um, the remuneration strategy is, is approved by the board. It is completely in line uh, with the board's recommendations. It was approved by shareholders. The specific joining arrangements were approved by shareholders. Uh, I've been brought in here to build a business, not sell a business, build a business. That is what I am focused on doing purely. Uh, and to do that, we need to invest. We also need to take tough decisions. We've taken decisions to uh, seek to modernise our news operation. We've taken a decision to face into the harsh reality that a channel which uh, uh, our team were doing a fantastic job running on very little resource simply hasn't worked. I don't know whether people have watched STV2 around the table. The, the, the harsh reality here is that hardly anyone was watching that channel. We get 350,000 people watching News at Six uh, I, I completely accept that, Mr. Pitts, and, and we will discuss that in more detail. Okay. But to stick with the issue of pay, you talk about having to make tough decisions and harsh reality. Uh, you this year will receive £1.2 million in total earnings. There are people in your newsroom on £18,000 a year, journalists, who are facing redundancy. Now, the harsh decision for them is about that's their livelihood and it must be incredibly hard for them to stomach that when they see people at the other end of the organization receiving the kind of remuneration that you are do you understand how harsh that is for them and did you consider forfeiting any of your total potential earnings for this year i understand how difficult the situation is for the people that are facing redundancy it's horrible uh, it is a very difficult situation we have made a series of difficult decisions that have a real impact on people's lives uh, we have done that in order to be able to grow this business, to use the savings that we are making in order to reinvest for the future uh, and also take some of the profit uh, that we are making to reinvest for the future. That is exactly what we're doing. But do I understand that these decisions are very difficult for the people concerned? Of course I do. Um, 
but they are necessary uh, in order to build for the future. That is what companies right across Scotland, the UK and the world have to do every day. Pick up the newspapers every morning and you'll see that this is a tough economic climate. It's the same for us. And if you don't change and you don't invest for the future, don't just wait for trouble to happen. Our news, which is very well respected and very well trusted and is comprehensive, uh, actually is losing audience overall by around 15% in, uh, in the last five years or so. We have not yet faced into the challenges of digital. Everyone these days consumes news in a very different way. Stories break in people's social feeds on their phones rather than in six o'clock bulletins. If we don't want to go the way of the newspapers, and obviously the newspapers, are the reason they are losing so much viewership is that the news is already known to people before the newspapers drop in through the mat every morning. If we don't change and embrace digital properly, then our audience will leave us at an even greater rate. That is the threat that we face. And yes, it does involve making difficult decisions, but the decisions we're taking are to go where our audiences are. Our under 55s who watch STV News consume more STV News online and on the move than they do on television. 70% um, uh, of our audience uh, for, for the news is above 55 years old. We have to change to engage new audiences. If we don't, we will fall behind our competitors um, and that is not acceptable for you as an outcome either. One, no, no problem. I'm afraid, Thanks. Richard Lockhead. Uh, thank you very much. <coughs> One of the strengths of STV in the past has been reflecting the nation's diversity and geographical needs. And in terms of your news output, you are proposing to cut the news team in STV North from 42 to 33. And I note that due to your committee appearance today, there's lots of TV cameramen outside the committee room there. Uh, but in the north and northeast of Scotland, I think I'm right in saying you're going to reduce the number of cameras to two to cover the whole of the north and northeast of Scotland, which is a huge, diverse geographical area. And of course, you're going to ask the remaining reporters, presumably, to become video journalists effectively. Does that not just simply lead to less news output and also an erosion of news output from out with the central belt in Scotland? I'll let Bobby come in on the detail in a second, but we have. Um, we have recommitted to uh, our licence arrangements and recommitted to two programmes from uh, SV North and Central. Uh, we haven't sought through any conversations with Ofcom to change a single clause of our public service commitments. And actually, uh, what we're doing in SV North is recommitting to a long-term future there. Uh, we have just signed a 15-year lease on the building. We have plans, detailed plans, to upgrade our technology, our property, to upgrade our studio to, to HD. You made a point that the number of cameras would, would reduce. That's the number of craft cameras. Overall, the number of cameras in the field, therefore our live capability will go up in, in, in the north from 15 to 18. We will be better placed to cover the whole breadth uh, of, 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 of that part of the country uh, than, than we ever have been. Bobby, the, some of the detail. I think the difference between the programmes that you see in the Central Belt and the North is indeed a very strong feature of STV's news output. And as we were saying earlier on, we have two versions of the programme in the North, one which includes material exclusively for Aberdeen in the North, and one which includes material that comes out of our Dundee studio. Again, that is a USP of STV news, and we're very proud of it. But it's also important to remember that the North team is not creating a whole programme themselves every day. So if you take the example of last night, just for example, uh, the story about the difficulty of finding housing, particularly in rural areas, was covered from Ely, which is exactly on the border as it happens between STV Central and STV North. But that's a piece that was carried in depth by both our programmes, in fact, all three of the programmes. Uh, there was a piece about the vote here in Parliament to pardon gay men for previously um, illegal activity that has since been decriminalised. That was a piece that was covered from, on all programmes but created in the central belt. There was a piece about the woes of TSB customers, etc., which was carried by all programmes. But in the north, the sinking of the data centre uh, into the sea, which was done out of Aberdeen, was a piece that was carried by teams in Edinburgh and in Glasgow. And they had a piece on the conference around health and safety in the offshore industry, 
on the 30th anniversary of the Piper Alpha disaster. So you have a combination, if you're a viewer in Aberdeen or in Orkney or Shetland or the Western Isles, a combination of material that is from your patch, from your neighbourhood, and is done by both the craft cameras and the video journalists of the future. But as well as that, there are stories that come to you from other news teams. So the reliance on our team in Aberdeen is for the stories that matter in that patch and with our Inverness team and our Dundee operation, we will continue to be the most local operation in Scotland. We'll continue to have the quality, but we have the richness of stories that resonate around Scotland. Um, I, I get that, but from my reading of the situation, you're going to ask the existing workforce or the smaller workforce to do more with less because they'll have to do the digital plus what they do just now. And, and what you've been good at in the past, if there's a, a fishing issue, you do a live bro broadcast from Peterhead or, or from Lerwick. If, if there's a storm, you have reporters out in the storm doing the reports. You may have someone outside RAF Lossiemouth, my own constituency, there's an issue to do with the, uh, the, the fleet there. Uh, I don't know how that's going to be possible with less cameramen or cameras, have cameras yep. in, in that part of the country. And is it not the case, Mr. Hayne, that you sent an email to your staff saying they've got to concentrate on fewer stories in the future. Uh, that kind of contradicts start, your we'll point having more that. news and more stories. Can I just take, uh, to answer the point about uh, asking our team to do more with less? Because that's, that's not what we're intending to do at all. We're asking our team to do things differently. That is absolutely the case. Firstly, uh, STV2 news will cease from the end of June. There are many bulletins during the day, including many that are made in Aberdeen, um, at one o'clock, uh, the seven o'clock show, but many hourly bulletins. We will not need that output, so the amount of overall output required from the North team, but also the Central team, will reduce. We're also not asking our teams to make the same programme. Uh, we are asking for a different programme. We're asking for a different mix, uh, more lives. We will have more cameras in the field, as I said, so there is more chance to do more lives from the length and breadth of, uh, of the country, um, more interviews, fewer packages, therefore, uh, and that, we think, by our calculations, and we are in discussion with our teams and the unions about precisely this point later today, will mean that the workload for the average journalist is comparable to what it is today. That's what we think. We are more than willing to discuss and show how that is the case. Um, and that's what a consultation is all about. We are uh, a couple of weeks in. We have three more weeks of discussions to have. Um, and those are the sorts of uh, important questions that we'll address. The productive discussions, because there is a big question mark over resources, but uh, Mr Bain, if you sent an email to staff in STV North saying there's to be concentration of fewer stories, how does that sit with the commitment to keeping the same level of news and respecting the diversity and geographical needs of an area of Scotland the size of some European countries? So what, what we are doing is putting equal emphasis on digital and broadcast and as a legacy television broadcaster, even though we have a successful and growing digital distribution, and it reflects the way that people now get their news, whether it's in their Facebook feed, they see it on Twitter, they use our app. This is a, a, an increasingly fast pace of change in media distribution, and we all are aware of that. If you count all of the stories that we make every day across those platforms, it's roughly 50 to 60 per day. And some of those stories got a lot of attention and they're very important stories and they feature prominently on television. They may not translate online currently or we may have stories that are a different mix online. Overall, there will be fewer stories. There'll be between 30 and 40 stories a day as opposed to 50 to 60. So the, the email that you're paraphrasing is about the emphasis on doing more stories in a detailed uh, and different way and using those stories across both television and digital. But the important th thing here is, as Simon has said, with the reduction in output and the moving away from all of the bulletins on STV2, which is a considerable overhead, the workload will be comparable in future for people creating those stories. And there will be also more video around these stories. And that is one of the anomalies I found when I arrived here, was that we have a, a digital team who are focused on digital news, but only 15% of the stories that they post online actually have a video attached to them. We're a television company. That should be our USP. And having more cameras in the field in STV North from uh, 15 to 18, and that is what is going to happen, we will have more opportunity to show more video, whether it's online or um, in our scheduled bulletins. That's the sort of more flexible future we want. We'll be better placed um, to report 
uh, the region uh, and report the country as a whole. We really believe that. And we haven't just conjured this idea up um, on our own in a, in a dark room. We have thought very carefully about this move from um, journalists to multimedia journalists. Uh, in virtually every newsroom, in every uh, broadcaster across the UK and around the world, this switch to multimedia journalists is taking place, or actually has already taken place. I'll give you an example. Uh, eight years ago, BBC Wales retrained 200 journalists as multimedia journalists. Um, yes, it takes time. There is always initially cynicism about an impact on, on quality because we're asking people to do things differently. But with the right support and a proper transition uh, phase, which is what we are offering over the next few months, then the output has retained its quality and is still impressive and award-winning, by the way, in the yearly uh, news uh, awards, uh, the RTS uh, News Awards. There is a very good mix of winners. They include craft camera pieces. They include video journalist pieces uh, alongside each other and, 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 and faring very well against each other. There is lots of evidence that this new model uh, has worked and will work for SDV. To be honest, we are, while we have fantastic journalists and a fantastic reputation, in terms of digital journalism and multimedia preparedness, we're playing a bit of catch up. Can I just come in there, uh, Mr. Pitts? I, perhaps I should declare an interest as I was a journalist and newspaper executive for many years before I became a politician, but it's journalists who create news. It's not technology that creates news. And uh, I, I wonder if you could answer the point that's raised by the NUJ that you will be the only national news service in the UK without a dedicated digital news desk. How does that, um, is that correct? And how, if so, how does that square with your uh, approach to future-proofing your news service? Everyone will be a digital journalist. That is the big, that is the big change But you here. won't have a digital news desk. No, we'll have, we'll have someone right at the top of the news organisation who is in charge of digital output for the very first time. At the moment, and this came as feedback from many of our news people when I arrived at STV, we are very broadcast focused. We are very focused for understandable reasons on our six o'clock bulletin and it does very well. But we don't embrace digital. Digital is a separate island almost. Sometimes we come together um, f with good effect, sometimes not. We need to put digital and broadcast on an equal footing. That is exactly what happens. With less journalists. Why with less journalists? No, they, they will all be digital journalists. We will have many more cameras in the field. We, will, we currently have 30. In the future, we'll have 40. We currently have a digital team who sit elsewhere and are not integrated properly into the newsroom. We will have an intakes editor who is in charge of bringing in the news for digital and for, uh, for broadcast, and then sitting alongside them for the first time we will have a broadcast outtake, uh, uh, output uh, executive, and we will have a digital output executive, shoulder to shoulder, making sure that we are embracing digital in a way that virtually every other news organisation has already done. Okay. Jamie Green. Uh, thank you, convener. Good morning, panel. Um, if I could uh, shift the conversation perhaps away from the news gathering aspect. Uh, first of all, open by saying I think actually any increase in original production Scotland will be welcome. Uh, by the creative industry, in, including any uh, new opportunities for, for original content, recurring content, and any job creation that recurs from that. I know it's difficult to see what the end result of that may be, but I should perhaps start with a positive, in, at least in that respect. Um, but I would like to move the conversation on to the local TV situation, STV2, and some of the circumstances around that. And it, perhaps it's unfair, Mr. Pitts has recently joined the organisation, so my question is maybe more direct to Mr. Hain, but can you tell me what has gone so catastrophically wrong with STV's decision to enter into the local TV market? Well, I think that when the local TV uh, world was announced, it wasn't clear what shape that would take and how it would uh, shake out. And we were interested and curious to try, uh, along with a number of other operators. You'll be aware that universally around the country, uh, there has been a commercial challenge to making these work. A lot of the operators have 
uh, been flattered in their early years, if you like, uh, in terms of revenue by money that they've received from the BBC, uh, from the licence fee settlement, which was uh, extra cash left over from digital switchover, which wasn't spent on switchover. Uh, people were able to apply to receive money from BBC in order to supply news stories. STV decided to uh, take none of that money, so we didn't take any of the money from the BBC and we supplied no news stories for the BBC. The reality is that uh, I think the, commercial, the, the local commercial TV model has been really flawed in how it was, how it was uh, set up. And not until we got into this and were actually running on a week-to-week -week basis uh, did we understand that the challenge of generating a new channel from scratch, which is like a mini version of what people know of the main public service broadcast channels. So this, this is a mixed genre service which unusually has considerable original programs to make. If you think about the, the Sky or the Virgin EPG full of hundreds of channels, the first five channels from BBC One through STV down to Channel 5, those five channels create and invest over 90% of the money in new programs. And the other 495 channels spend next to nothing by comparison. It is very difficult to create and establish a new brand in that marketplace. And one of the things that has become clear to us as we've run these services for, for four years since the inception of STV Glasgow is, when you talk to people in focus groups, as I've done many times, and when you do research, people say they like the programmes. There's no problem with the, with, with the idea that you can create and reflect the local areas. And I think our team has done a fantastic job in doing that. They've, they've done live sport, they do live news programmes, they do the live magazine programme, they do creative late show programming. They really have made the most of the budget. The challenge is that if you run additional programmes, and the news is a good example, what people will say is, I really like the idea of a seven o'clock news for STV News tonight, which has Scottish and UK and international dimensions, but I'm already watching the news at six o'clock and I can watch the news at 10 o'clock. And there's Channel 4 news that's been there for decades that I can also watch. It's simply the case that the, the, the reality of peak time television viewing is it is very habitual. So people go to the soaps that they know, they go to the entertainment shows that they know, and they watch the big dramas that change at nine o'clock. And this is bookended at six o'clock and 10 o'clock by flagship news programs. It is very, very difficult on a commercial basis to establish a presence and make a commercial success in that marketplace, and that's the reality. Can, can I just share some of the, some of the figures around the chat? Because I think that really helps to understand the economics of local TV and why we've made the decision that we've made. Because STV, from when I came in, uh, have certainly given local television a a, a very good shot over the last four years and have tried very hard to make it work. We have lost cumulatively over three million pounds in total from running this channel. We spend six million pounds a year marketing STV2. If you watch STV main channel on any given evening, you cannot fail to see a promotion to turn over to watch a channel on STV2. And that hasn't worked. And the, the simple truth, although it's uh, somewhat chastening, is that the audience aren't there for local television and aren't there for our programmes. I'll give you a couple of examples. Our highly lauded 7 o'clock news, uh, news service, uh, which is a fantastic mix of international, national and local, gets 1,800 viewers. Not even 18,000, 1,800 viewers. Uh, uh, news at 6 gets 200 times that, at 350,000 or so. Uh, our Live at 5 magazine show at 5 o'clock in the afternoons every, every day gets 2,100 viewers. Our late night talk show with you and Cameron gets 1,300 viewers. Our News at 1 gets 1,300 viewers. And it's not that we just have to be patient and the audiences will grow, unfortunately. In the last year alone, our news bulletins on STV2 have lost over 75% of their initial audience when they launched. It simply isn't a sustainable model. We cannot justify asking our teams to make shows that are extremely good and well put together that no one is watching. That is not the right thing to do. However, there are some, there are some green shoots here. There are certain shows that have worked well 
and that have transferred, therefore, onto the main channel. One example of that is, is the People's History Show, which is transferred to the main channel and gets audiences of about 240,000 people or so. That is a fantastic model. We will be continuing uh, with that show. There are a number of other shows, like our Edinburgh Festival coverage, or our Appeal Show, or our, or our um, New Year Show, uh, that we have asked the STV2 team to stay on and do. And I mentioned earlier that we have just created, uh, we announced a few weeks ago that we were creating a new formats unit that will employ seven people initially in order to try to win new commissions. Our STV2 team have been invited um, to apply uh, for those roles. Um, so there is an opportunity to, to, to grow shows out of the STV2 model. Our decision that we've taken is it is not economic to run a channel. It is hugely costly running a channel, satellite capacity, transmission capacity, um, other, other technology. We have decided we're going to use that money to invest in bigger, better, fewer programming okay, I mean, on STV main channel. I appreciate there, there are very f f fulfilled answers, but we, we are quite tight in time, and I did have some other questions, so yes, if I could move on, that would be great. Um, I mean, Mr. Ian, you, you sound almost surprised four years down the line that this hasn't worked. I mean, surely when you went into this, and it's also worth noting that you do sit on the board of the local TV operator, operating company, um, so you've had an oversight of the industry uh, in its entirety across the UK and all the various models that exist. You know, do you think you made uh, the wrong decision to enter this market? You've wasted three million pounds. We're, we're, we're at a situation where uh, dozens of people are losing their jobs, perhaps as a result of some of those wrong decisions. You were there at the beginning of this decision making. Do you not accept any personal responsibility for this? Well, hindsight is always twenty twenty, and actually the uh, the opportunity in television and in media and the combination of licenses that was advertised and subsequently let appeared to us to be complementary at the time as, uh, as, a, as a, a good idea to go alongside the existing Channel 3 service, which, as we said previously, is also very well known and characterised by its localness as opposed to other TV services. And I think the same is true on a wider scale across the country. Uh, there was, the, this was seen somewhere between community radio and local radio and television. The reality is nobody knew how it was going to, to pan out. I think we've given it our best shot. I think we've developed some amazing properties. And I think, although we're drawing a line under STV2 itself, the spirit of STV2 in terms of production and the experience is moving on. And we are going to make new shows. We are investing in content with an engine room of seven people. There will, we will need to increase that every time we get a commission, either for ourselves, for our regional programming on STV, or for other partners. And that experience that we've had making STV2 shows will stand us in good stead and will stand the people in good stead as we go forward. Hopefully, they'll continue to work with us on new shows. Not all of them will immediately, but in the fullness of time, if we grow the Scottish sector and the Scottish economy and make more shows over time, there will be more work and more jobs. And my final question is around the transfer of the licenses to the new operator. Uh, what due diligence and processes have you gone through for, for this? Uh, because I'm aware that the company that will be taking over the local TV licenses in Scotland, do you have any idea what they're going to do with them? Uh, the director of the business that runs that company sits alongside you on the board uh, of Comox. So how is that process uh, done uh, in terms of the uh, approval from the board and indeed the shareholders of that company. Um, what uh, structure have you taken in terms of the approach of the transfer of the licenses and what guarantees have you been given by the new operator of these local TV licenses that they will still continue to provide local content, develop local TV uh, talent, creativity in Scotland and invest uh, in, in these new channels that they're acquiring from you I, I feel that you have a huge responsibility in the passing over these licenses to a new operator that the, they fulfil their obligations and th th that you took over when you took the licenses on in the first place. Well, the reality, of course, is that they will have that obligation. And as they acquire the licenses, and we're in uh, exclusive negotiation with them just now with a view to them acquiring those licenses, um, in the event that that happens, and we, we have every reason to believe it will, at the point where they assume the ownership of the licenses and they uh, acquire the license holding companies, all of the obligations uh, will pass to them. And it will be Ofcom, quite rightly, that hold them to account 
for the, the very assets and the uh, obligations that you describe. I'd like to move on. Tavish Scott. I wonder if I could ask uh, Mr Pitts about uh, your earlier statement regarding uh, this strategy not being about preparing STV for sale, because obviously there's been a lot of speculation about that um, uh, since the announcements were made. Um, my understanding is that, your main, that STV's main shareholder is an activist um, fund called Crystal Amber. Is that so? What do they do? They invest in a series of businesses. Um, in order to get a return for their own shareholders. So the Telegraph said on the 2nd of February, if I've got it right, um, sorry, the 19th of February, um, about Crystal Amber, that the correlation between companies we invest in, which are subsequently taken over, is very high. Are you familiar with that? I am familiar with that. And so do you have any worries about this, this being your major shareholder? No, uh, actually, uh, quite the contrary. They, they have been nothing but supportive of STV since they became a, a shareholder a number of, a number of years ago. Um, they are supportive of the new strategy. And they're not supportive of the new strategy because we're telling them we're making cuts. They're supportive of the new strategy because we've set out a plan for growth. And that's what they want to see. They want to see a company like any other company uh, on, on the FTSE or any other stock market around the world investing to grow, uh, whether it's in digital or in content or in broadcasting. Uh, they have been extremely supportive, uh, both historically, as I understand it, uh, before my time and certainly since I've come here. Uh, they have asked about investment and what we are doing to grow the business and we've responded uh, to them but also to every other shareholder and because it's the right thing to do with a plan that invests uh, in the future of the creative economy. And I understand really the concerns when, when we all read that this company invests so that they can see companies taken over. Look, the, the, That's what they say, I, it's very, in their website. Yeah, I understand that. I am, uh, I'm very clear what my job is here. My job here is to uh, put in place a strategy that delivers uh, an independent uh, future for our company uh, that is a growth strategy that takes advantage of the huge opportunity we've got. And I have to say, the best possible defence against any sort of takeover uh, is investment, is a growth strategy. The worst possible thing I or anyone else could do in this situation uh, is to not invest for the future, is to not face into the harsh, harsh decisions about closing a channel that isn't working, to, to not uh, seek to modernise our news operation. That is when, I don't that's that's when you become true, a vulnerable... To your yeah. point, though, uh, Mr Scott, that's, that's when you become a vulnerable company, precisely because people looking on from outside, prospective buyers from looking on outside, see you not making yeah. the difficult decisions and know that they could easily come in, make those decisions, add the value themselves, and then your independence yeah, is lost. Uh, forgive me, but that's not what Crystal Amber are. They are, a comp they are an investment vehicle, according to their own website, to invest in businesses so they can see them taken over. But I can, I can tell you our experience of Crystal Amber so far. So you've met them quite regularly, have you? I've met them as, as, just as I have met every other shareholder since I've got here. Yeah. Um, I can tell you our experience, and, and before my time as well, for the last uh, five years when they have been uh, on our stock register, that they have been nothing but supportive. They think, as we do, that our shares are undervalued, uh, that we have a growth strategy and potential in Scotland and around the world that is much greater than is currently being reflected in our, in our share price. So they see a real opportunity, like our other shareholders, for us to grow. They have been nothing but supportive. Uh, and they are encouraging us uh, uh, to invest, to grow our business for the future, and that's exactly what we've done. So you have no worries that they're not they're, they're your major investor and they're there to simply see the company grow and then sell it off? I take, it as, I take it as I see it, and as I see it, uh, uh, and my dealings with Crystal Amber so far have been nothing but supportive. They want us to invest, to grow our business, to realise our true potential, quite like our other shareholders. Okay, thank you. Did you meet Crystal Amber before you became Chief Executive? No. No. Okay, thank you. Mary Goodjohn. Thank you, Convener. I really just want to come back to uh, pick up on a few other points that have been raised previously, in particular by Richard Lockhead. Now, you said in your opening statement that your intention isn't to do more with less. You reiterated that to, to Richard Lockhead as well. But to be honest, I, I just feel like I can't square that with the, with the proposals that you've laid out. I mean, we heard already about the, the really fewer stories um, which always rings alarm bells for me. Like Richard Lockhead, I represent a rural constituency in the northeast uh, of Angus North and Mearns. Uh, in the briefing we had from the NUJ, they said that we need fewer journalists, they were told, 
uh, said that STV stated we need fewer journalists to work at the company as we will be covering fewer stories. And I believe that there are currently 10 reporters in Aberdeen, four part-time, six full-time, and the proposals are to cut that to five full-time equivalents. And what the makeup of that is uh, remains to be seen. So how can you possibly still continue to cover, still continue to, to have the reputation that you state that you have where you're a national leader if you have less journalists uh, covering presumably fewer stories? Shall I take this? Yeah. Well, I think as, as we've said previously, we will be covering fewer stories and that's not because there'll be shorter programmes. We'll be doing more stories in greater depth, which will provide greater coverage. And there'll be a number of stories that we have on the website which in many cases are actually not location specific, uh, that we will translate to both broadcast and digital. And the question on the North East staffing and the STV North staffing as a whole, I think it's absolutely right to say that we are retaining our configuration of licenses exactly the same as it currently is. And it is the most localised news service anywhere across Scotland. Uh, we've got a strong presence in Inverness, we've got a strong presence in Aberdeen and in Dundee. But our output will be changing. And in fact, when we close STV2, a lot of the material that's currently seen on STV2 is created and prepared in Aberdeen. That's a considerable workload that will no longer be part of the daily mix there. Uh, we have in plans, most importantly, uh, the provision to go to more cameras across all parts of Scotland. I mean, the, the change in technology, and this is, by the way, not that we start doing this from scratch, we already have a mixed economy of craft camera and video journalist operators. But the world of technology enables more and more people to create content, and that is only going to continue. Uh, and we are embracing that, and we will have more stories and more uh, technology to help. And let me give you an example of how that works. At the moment, if our Inverness reporter goes out to cover something on what is the largest patch of any Channel 3 license in the country, they are often driving for hours to get somewhere to do a piece, and they have to drive hours back to the studio so that we can get it into our system. By investing in new technology and being able to capture material remotely and then edit it on the spot and get it back to the studios or get it back to our Pacific Key headquarters, we can get material much more quickly. That's a much more efficient use of everybody's time, and it means that the amount of time traveling is not lost time for people making stories and creating material. Even with no additional workload, they're just able to do more of what they want to do and less of going between stories and all the administration that goes with it. So we're very confident that on a like-for-like -like basis, our new configuration of uh, our new lineup and our new organizational structure will be a comparable workload, but lead to uh, more in-depth material being filed and being presented. And it's also not five. Uh, editorial roles that are at risk, it's three, uh, and we will be seeking to and are confident we can minimise uh, any compulsory redundancies there through, through VR. And it's worth saying, again, that we, we know this model works in other news operations. We've seen it. I sat on the board of ITN for 10 years. I have seen this done. Uh, it is being done in Sky, in the BBC, in ITV, in CNN, in CBC in Canada. Many of them started this process eight to 10 years ago. Yes, it involves quite a lot of change and people doing things differently. What we're not going to do is flick a switch at, at a point later in June and say, right, move from current world into new world. We have to support and train our journalists. It's also an opportunity to learn new skills for a number of journalists who, who might want that for their career at STV and, 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 and beyond. Uh, but we are confident, not because we've made this up on our own in a room, but because we've seen it done. We've spoken to many newsrooms who have also done it, done it and been through these changes. It's not easy. At the start, there is cynicism and scepticism about an impact on quality. But over time, it has proven to work. It has been accepted. Um, and uh, the, those teams have gone from strength to strength. That is the experience that we've brought to this. Uh, and, and with a number of experts that we've worked with. I, I just have to say, though, I mean, I do think that you say that there's a comparable workload, but I, I just don't see how that can be the case when really you are expecting the reporters that you do have to do more and there will be uh, less, less of them. And I think that I know that you say there'll be more in-depth stories, but again, 
I, think, I do think the local element of that will, will suffer. To me, one of the main USPs of STV has been the, the local element of it. Uh, I've been involved in campaigns, as I'm sure many people around this table have, that have been picked up by, by STV uh, and not touched by reporting Scotland, which always seems to be predominantly central belt focused, and you struggle to get stories from the northeast or anywhere beyond the central belt uh, into the news. And I, I think that the situation also reminds me of what we've seen in the print media. I mean, Angus, I represent the north half of Angus. We have, I think, six local titles within Angus uh, that are published weekly. But as uh, gradually as print media is reduced, uh, you know, we've seen the centralisation uh, uh, of those of the staff there and we don't see any local stories within those papers anymore it just tends to be angus generic so why would i buy that paper over buying something like the courier which covers all those stories anyway and does so on a daily basis and i fear then that what you have as a as a usp as i've already stated that will be eroded and that will be a loss if you go with the proposals that you've currently laid out <coughs> Well, we're very confident that the, the strengths that you describe are absolutely underpinned by this strategy. And what we've learned from the newspapers is how not to do it. And that is exactly why we've reaffirmed our commitment to Aberdeen. We've got a big technical change happening in our Aberdeen studios, which will take us into the HD world. Uh, we're upgrading our Dundee facility and we're upgrading Inverness for the very reasons that you describe in order to maintain our localness the way that we gather news will change, but the world is changing around us. The use of smartphones to create content by everybody uh, has been a revolution. And actually, at a, at a similar level, the world of television news gathering is changing as well, as Simon has said, in newsrooms across the world. So we're absolutely committed to the North programme for the strengths that we described earlier on. As I was pointing out to Mr Lockhead, it is, of course, a combination of stories from the North East and from the North of Scotland, as well as stories of resonance that are important to people in Aberdeen, even though they don't happen in Aberdeen, because they're important to Scotland as a whole. That combination is our strength in the North and has been for decades and will continue to be so. Uh, can I also indicate I had a meeting with Mr Pitts earlier this week. Earlier in evidence, Mr Pitts, you said that you had thought very carefully about this move. Uh, as far as I can see, this entire saga has been a public relations disaster for STV. You are damaged in the community, you are damaged in the industry, and you're hitting the headlines for all the wrong reasons. We've heard today from others about the luck, lack of regional and national news, and I've not heard anything from you that gives me confidence that that's not going to be the case. Uh, we've also talked about the staff and how they've been managing the situation, and I think as an industry, they've been very good at coping with change and having to be asked to do things, but uh, I think you're now asking them to multitask even more than they ever had before. You, you talk about being a trusted voice in Scottish news and current affairs. Uh, I've really heard nothing today that gives me that confidence that you will be that trusted voice in Scottish news and current affairs. Uh, and as I say, how, how do you see yourself trying to get back some of the control that you've lost in the story so far? Well, look, my, my job here um, is not to conduct a public relations exercise. It's to set out a plan uh, to grow our business uh, that our viewers, our team, our shareholders all believe in. I have a lot of support at SCV to deliver this strategy. Uh, it is the right strategy uh, for the business. It invests for the future. It puts new content, digital expansion, but also, yes, news front and centre in what we're doing. We want to be Scotland's home of news and entertainment. We will still be investing more in news than anything else. And yes, you're right, the, uh, the, the prize of being trusted and being comprehensive and being the best news service in Scotland is hard fought and it's hard won and we do not want to undermine that. We have no intention of doing so. That's why we're committing to not touch a single clause of our public service licences. What we are doing is modernising to prepare ourselves for a future that is frankly already here. People consume news, you consume news in a very, very different way to how we did five years ago, and it is accelerating. It's not slowing down. I have a duty on behalf of not just shareholders, but viewers and also our team to prepare our business for the future. 
Yes, that involves taking some tough decisions that aren't always popular in every corner of the country or in every corner of my organisation. But that's what I'm paid to do. That's what I've done. I am very confident that with a very talented team, we will deliver on that growth strategy. I'm purely focused on doing that. And I hope that today marks the start of a wider understanding of why we're doing this in the first place. We have a wonderful opportunity you, this committee has spent many weeks thinking about the future of Scottish Screen. We have a huge opportunity ahead of us that currently we simply do not make the best of to put the Scottish television sector right back on the map. We do not yet punch our weight. We need returning series made by Scottish production companies. I intend for STV to be absolutely at the forefront of that. It takes investment, it takes skill, it takes working with the best creative talent in the industry, whether it's news or current affairs. And to your point about current affairs, we have a wonderful programme called, called Scotland Tonight, which hopefully you all watch, and I'm sure a number of you have appeared on. We're not touching Scotland Tonight. We're very proud of it. It has a long-term future. We don't do that because we have a requirement to do it under our public service licences. We do it because we want to do it, and we will continue to do it. But, but you must acknowledge the frustrations that you have created in this situation. Of course I do. Uh, and the anxiety that is now out there. Uh, and as I say, today you've had the opportunity to, to come here and give us the points that you raised. And you have put forward your case. Uh, uh, but as I say, I yet am to be convinced that the case that you are putting forward is going to enhance STV in Scotland as a news and current affair programme. Well, you're right that the proof of it is on screen. The proof of it is on screen, and that's where we'll be judged. That is where every other news organisation around the world has been judged when they've made changes that are almost identical to the ones that we're proposing. So let's judge the we'll impact on screen. On. Thank you. You've, thank you. Stuart McMillan. Thank you for being on. Um, good morning, panel. Earlier on, uh, you mentioned uh, working groups and discussions are undergoing. Um, can you provide a bit more information about these working groups, when they started, uh, who's involved with them, uh, and... Uh, when you anticipate that they will actually be, uh, they will fulfil their particular role? So we're in a formal consultation process, which is around the changes that we are proceeding with, and uh, as a statutory basis that would be uh, a month. In fact, we're going longer than a month uh, to give people more detail and more time to consider how the changes might work. Um, that is around the structure and the detail of how people's roles may be impacted and how they might change. At the same time, we're starting to build the future vision of news from the news gathering that we've talked extensively about today and also the point that we've just made which is how this actually looks not just on television screens but on smartphones and websites and so on and so forth. We are going to start a number of those work streams. Our news management team has already been involved in starting to think about how we make the next generation of STV news and when the consultation process is complete then our wider news team will join that process and work with us to build the new news products of the future. That sounded to me that uh, you're asking the current workforce to plan uh, the jobs uh, ahead as compared to yourselves actually having, you published your strategy um, with, with yourselves actually not really having a full plan in terms of what you actually want to do. Well, there, there are two slightly separate processes. One is about jobs and structure, which is the consultation process. Mm -hmm. Once we are downstream of that, there is the actual process of working out exactly what our news uh, will look like in future based on the, va the vision and the plan and the ambitions that we have. Okay. Um, in terms of uh, going forward, uh, with the issue of the, uh, of the roles and the jobs, um, what, when do you anticipate uh, job descriptions and salaries to be published for these new roles? Well, we've, we are right in the process of doing that. We've already published job specs for assistant editor, multimedia journalist, assistant producer, production journalist, multi-skilled tech operator, SNG engineer, multimedia graphics uh, coordinator. So we are, we are already doing this. We are providing our teams with the information they need to make informed decisions about whether they want to be part of uh, uh, the new world of SCV News. Will these be for, be for every single role, or is it, um, are, you st are there still some to be done? For, for, the, um, for the roles that are new, we have provided job specs. For roles that are unchanged as a result of the, of the process, we, we haven't felt the need to because um, those roles aren't at risk. Okay. Um, uh, so then your JD also provided us with uh, some information, and uh, there was an aspect that they provided us with which I was really quite uh, shocked at. Uh, and that was 
Um, apparently, uh, some uh, members of staff, uh, there's been confusion in terms of whether they will or will not have a role going forward. Uh, and one of the, the, the allegations was that uh, a member of staff uh, of the, the news team was, uh, was informed uh, shortly before they're about to go do a live broadcast that the role that they may yeah. or may not uh, have a job going forward. Now, well, surely that's not the right way to actually treat people. Uh, my understanding of that, and I wasn't in the room when that conversation took place, my understanding of it from our team uh, was that uh, that person was given the chance to, uh, or the, the, the option to either hear what the impact of these changes were uh, on his or her future, or to wait until after the news and they chose to hear it now. That is my understanding of the situation, if it's the same example that you're talking about. But we have to give people... Uh, choices. Actually, what we've done, uh, there has been uh, concern about the provision of information, um, and uh, these things are, are difficult, um, and uh, they take time. And we've taken a couple of decisions uh, at the start of the process um, that we don't regret, uh, that were the right things to do, but that have had the effect of um, uh, information taking time to come out to the rest of the group. And the first of those decisions was that um, we wanted to talk to every individual one-on-one -on -one about, in a private conversation about the impact of these proposals on their future careers. We didn't want, we took the decision not to give everyone all information all at once in a group situation because the worry was that individuals would be able to identify that their roles were at risk. And would you rather find out um, in, in a group in front of all of your peers that uh, your role is at risk or would you rather have that in a private conversation? We thought the best thing to do was the latter. The consequence of that is that we had to have close to 200 conversations, one-on-one uh, -on -one conversations, which took time. The second decision we took was that we were going to prioritise those one-on-one -on -one meetings with our STV2 team because the news that they had heard that day were, was somewhat more <coughs> definitive around the closure of the channel. Again, that took time and meant that we didn't get to the news team until slightly later. Um, I appreciate there are always concerns. You can never have enough information about the impact on your, uh, on your job or future career. That's also why we listened to the team and have extended the deadlines here. We extended the voluntary redundancy deadline until tomorrow. We've extended the consultation deadline uh, by two weeks to the end of June. Um, we don't want to rush uh, our teams into making decisions, um, uh, and we won't do that. We haven't got a savings target by a certain time that we are tying ourselves to. Or we want to manage this transition in the right way uh, and give people the right support and training um, to face into the, the, the new way we're organising news. Can you guarantee that nobody will be forced to take a pay cut? Uh, with any of the new roles going forward? Yes, that's, uh, yes, that's not our intention at all. Uh, this isn't about paying people uh, less for the same job um, or a different job. Um, uh, we will, when we are recruiting and, 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 and selecting um, our, our, our new team, whether it's multimedia journalists or others, uh, we want a mix of, of skills and experience. There will be some people um, in the new team uh, that have... Um, that have been trained already as video journalists um, and have only been at STV a little while and are, are, are fresh maybe out of college or university and there will be others who haven't been trained uh, and that will take a bit more time therefore to be fully trained as a multimedia journalist uh, but will be more experienced uh, through the experience that they've accumulated working on STV for a number of years. We want that mix of skills in our team. Uh, we think that's, that's a good way uh, uh, to run the newsroom. And have you ruled out uh, compulsory redundancies if you don't get enough people who put their names forward for the voluntary redundancy scheme? No, we haven't ruled that out. Okay. Thank you. We are joined at the committee today by our former member, Jackson Carlaw. We are uh, pleased and surprised to see you back so soon, Jackson. Um, would you like to ask a question? Well, I thank you for the opportunity yeah. to convene. I realise you're short of time, so I yes. won't cover ground that's already thank been covered. Um, I am excited about the opportunity you've talked about for the development of new drama, uh, something I pursued with your predecessor over many years and, and without much success. You referred to previous big shows, Taggart, Take the High Road. Those were commissioned in an era where the independent ITV network was still a mix of a number of smaller companies. It's now consolidated into ITV and STV. Um, the drama commissions you talked about, ironically, are for the BBC, which, which is nice, but I would like to see the BBC commission programming, if you like, from independence. And I wonder, from your own perspective, what are the commissioning obstacles and challenges now for STV 
to actually break into the ITV network because it's been suggested that they are almost insurmountable because they see the ITV network for drama as something that is much more sort of centralised and therefore much harder for STV to break into with new drama commissioning because those returning series in terms of the screen inquiry that the committee is otherwise looking at are very, very important along with the BBC and the streaming services to the larger, wider creative industries in Scotland. That's a good question because it is, it is more difficult to break into the ITV network these days for, for, for one simple reason that ITV but also every other um, broadcaster around the world are trying to make their own shows. So ITV uh, want to commission their own drama departments and their own drama labels to make drama. Of course, they are under an obligation and they adhere to it um, to, uh, to commission on merit. So if we've got a good enough idea that is exciting uh, and will drive an audience, then I'm sure they will listen. Another obstacle, uh, Mr. Carlo, is, is, is money. Uh, to be honest. The reason we are focused, at least initially, on making drama for other networks is that the economics are easier for us. It means that BBC um, or another commissioning broadcaster will put up some of the money, we'll put up some of the money, an international distributor will put up some money. Increasingly, you have to have a patchwork funding model for these dramas in order that they are properly financed to the, to the level of quality that's required for people these days. Um, but we have some hope that we'll be able to co-produce in the future dramas for our own channel. It won't be immediately. The £15 million is focused on other types of programming, at least initially. But I don't know about you, I, I watch Shetland on BBC and I have mixed feelings. One, I think that is a brilliant show. And two, I think, why don't we make it? It is frustrating that that is being made by a company outside of Scotland when it is so obvious that we should be doing things like that. So in the face of that, we've done what we think is the next best thing. Um, the lady who created both Shetland and Vera, uh, Elaine Collins, a celebrated Scottish uh, uh, producer and creator, uh, we have just done a, an exclusive deal with. Uh, she now works in partnership with STV Productions. The next drama she makes will be made exclusively with STV, and we are extremely excited to be working with her. But it's that sort of investment and partnership with talent that we need in order to make sure that the Scottish creative economy really punches its weight going forwards. And we are, it costs money, it takes time, it will be, require piloting and trial and error, but we hope to get there. Thank you. Thank you. Camille. Thank you. I um, have a very short supplementary from Jamie Green. Uh, thank you, Camino. <clears throat> I think the key to all of this will be uh, protecting the quality, the quantity and the plurality of independent news output in Scotland. That's what's really at risk here and that's what people are talking about. The STV journalists I've spoken to have said there absolutely will be a detrimental effect to the quality and quantity of output as a result of the changes you're making. <clears throat> you on the other hand are saying everything will be fine. So we as a committee, who do we believe? The journalists on the ground doing the work or the executive management team who are trying to balance books? I'm not saying this is easy, uh, and nor is Bobby, um, but it's necessary. Uh, and we have made these judgments based on a lot of evidence from other news organisations bigger than us that have been through similar exercises, and they have been through it in a similar way. At first, there is concern and a bit of cynicism about how this will work in practice. And I totally understand that. It is a brand new way of working for some. For some, they've already been doing it for many years since the start of their careers. So there is concern about how it will work. There is understandably concern about workloads. We've sought to respond to those concerns by saying, you'll have support and training, and we won't be asking you to do the same as we're asking you to do today, because there will be less news as a result of the STV2 uh, changes, so there are just fewer bulletins that we're doing as a result, and as a result of a change in mix. If we were asking people to do exactly the same, the same show, the same number of bulletins, with less resource, I think people would have a point. But I totally accept that some of the uh, STV news team are not there yet, and I totally accept that there is concern, a genuinely felt concern, about quality, and that's what's driving most of uh, of the questioning, both here and also back at STV. And we have to work with the teams 
and it, it continues this afternoon with a conversation with the unions and the, and the representatives of, of STV uh, about quality in news, where we will share our understanding of how this should work going forward, uh, the impact on workload, the extra technology that will be at people's disposals, and we will work through those concerns one by one with the team. Uh, we're very confident we can come out the other end with a very high quality news service. Uh, Mr. Pitts, could I just intervene in terms of Jamie, Jamie uh, Green's question there? Perhaps a solution might be to release the consultant's report uh, that DMA Media did for you, which I understand hasn't been shared with staff but is used to justify the changes that you've made. Perhaps if you release that to the committee, we could see what the, uh, what the truth is between the two different versions of uh, events. Well, well, we'll consider that uh, and we'll come back to you on it. Uh, the news team uh, at DMA Media who were engaged to work with us are uh, experts in their field. There are very few, uh, they might even be the only expert news consultancy out there. The people that did the work are journalists that have worked on uh, Sky, BBC News, ITV News, have worked with many international customers down the, down the years. M maybe you'd like to... It's up to you, Kavina, how you run your committee. Maybe you'd like to talk to them uh, about their experience of how this has worked uh, in, in other news organisations. I'd certainly like to see the report on STV. We will, we will consider that and come back to you. Um, mm. It's not true to say that um, uh, no one in the team has seen that. We have shared that with the uh, senior news team um, who have seen it and read it cover to cover. Well, the staff and unions, the unions are saying they haven't seen it and it hasn't been shared with staff. Look, we'll, we'll, we'll take that back. Uh, there, isn't, um, there isn't anything to, to hide. Okay. We, uh, we, we'll need to have a look at okay. uh, how we do that. Uh, Ross Greer wanted to come back in. Yes, thanks, Convener. Um, I'll be very brief. Um, just very quickly, Mr Pitts, you mentioned earlier on your surprise at the lack of stories that were going up online without video content. It's been pointed out on social media during the course of this meeting that STV used to have a dedicated digital video uh, team, but that was uh, lost as a result of previous cuts and staff were, were made redundant, which brings us back to this point of, of remaining staff doing more with less. But the final question I wanted to ask is in relation to industrial action. There are staff balloting at the moment, and I wouldn't want to preempt that ballot, but as an uh, incoming or relatively recent uh, chief executive, I wonder if you could clarify your position in relation to industrial action, and if you could confirm that you would not employ any tactics that would undermine action taken by your staff. Uh, well, obviously, we hope to avoid industrial action, if at all possible. Uh, I don't think that's what anyone wants. We are engaged in a... Uh, an extensive consultation with our teams and with the unions. Uh, we are providing uh, lots of information in order for the teams to make informed decisions. I said earlier that later this afternoon we have another meeting with the unions where we're talking specifically about maintaining quality and how we, uh, how we intend to do that and hearing their views and other representatives' views on it. Um, we have extended those consultation deadlines in order that we can have a full conversation. We have a full three weeks to go uh, of, of discussions. Um, I, I really hope that we will be able to avoid industrial action. Um, obviously, if it happens, we, we will deal with it. And uh, as regards tactics, I'm not sh sure I understand what you mean. Uh, we will be playing a straight bat um, and trying to do what's best for the future of our business. Thank you very much. Just a couple, if we could answer these as briefly as possible, a couple of questions I have at the end. You talked a lot about, uh, in the answer to Jackson Carlo and others, about your ambitions uh, for increasing content. Um, ITV um, do not have an obligation uh, by, put on them by Ofcom to have a, a nation's output. They have a, re, a, a region's output that they have got to uh, uh, adhere to, but not a nation's, and that's something that Ofcom are considering. Would you support that? Uh, I th my understanding of it, and I'm just trying to wrap my brains to remember what the obligations were, but I think they have a 35% But I can London assure you they don't have a like nation's, that. we've spent a lot of time looking this, at this, they do not have a nation's obligation. Would you support ITV having an obligation to commission content, proportion of content from the nations of the UK? Look, that's something that should be considered in the round. I notice that, a note that there is a BBC commitment, there is a, a new Channel 4 commitment, they are publicly owned organisations and uh, I think it's right that the bar is, is set slightly higher. Uh, for ITV, the conundrum is always to balance the level of the obligations, and that includes STV2, 
uh, the level of the obligations with the benefit of holding the licenses. Mm. And those benefits are slightly But you don't imbalanced. work for ITV anymore? You I work, work for, for Channel STV? Th I work for STV, which is part of Channel 3 convener. We are under uh, very similar obligations to the ITV network. And the balance is always, is the, is the value of the license enough to justify imposing further restrictions? Yeah. And in this day of digital and VOD, uh, the, that balance is much more coming into question. S sorry, but... You, you, I, ITV is, is separ a separate company yes, from separate STV company. as we have explored um, uh, today. Yeah. Yeah. Now, if your aim, as you have said today, is your ambition for STV as a content producer to make more content for the network, you should be supportive of Ofcom I'd be happy having for that a, to be a nation's putting a nation's obligation ITV. I'd be happy for that uh, to be considered, convener. So you do support it? I'd be happy for it to be considered yeah, part okay. in the round. Thank you very much for coming to give evidence to us today. We'll now suspend. I'm going to private, I'm going to private session. Thank you.